Welcome to 2018 and episode 207 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing Carol Krishner, who is an entertainment career strategist. She has a ton of experience in television. She created the CBS Diversity Institute Writers Mentoring Program, and she helped develop the WGA Showrunner Training Programs curriculum. So she's got a lot of great advice for people looking to break into television, so stay tuned for that. That interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast and then just look for episode 207. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address, and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional log line and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Just want to quickly mention the writers group that I'm in. We're always looking to add good writers to the rotation. We meet every Tuesday at 715 until about 10 p.m. in Sherman Oaks, California, right around where the 405 and the 101 intersect. Here's how it works. Each week, three member writers put up around 25 pages of a screenplay that they're currently working on. This can be TV, it can be a web series, or of course it can be a feature film. The pages are read on stage by professional actors in front of the other writers in the group. And then the listening writers give notes on the present to the presenting writers. As a member writer, you'll be putting up pages about every five weeks. It's a great way to workshop your material, network with other talented actors and writers, and hone your critical thinking skills by giving notes to the other writers. This is a live in-person event, so you need to live somewhere near Sherman Oaks, California to be able to attend weekly. If you're not in the Los Angeles area, perhaps consider starting a writer's group of your own. Nearly every city in the world has a community of filmmakers and writers in most cases. They're just looking for someone to step up and be a leader, be a leader and get things organized. The one big stumbling block for people with this group is that you have to be committed to showing up nearly every Tuesday, even when you're not up, so that you can give notes to the other writers who are up. If you'd like to learn more about the group, go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash writers group. Writers group is all lowercase and all one word, and of course, I will link to it in the show notes as well. So a quick few words about what I'm working on. A quick update on The Pinch, the crime action thriller feature film that I am finishing up. So there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is The Pinch is officially finished. And I know most of the listeners of this podcast are sick of hearing me talk about it. So that's the bad news. Unfortunately, I'm not done talking about it. As even though the film is complete, there's still a lot of work to be done, namely marketing and distribution. So I will continue to give updates as I figure out distribution and hopefully get accepted to a few film festivals. I'm saying it halfway jokingly that people are getting sick of it. Honestly, the most of the email, not most, all the emails I've gotten about mentioning the pinch on the podcast have been very much positive. People seem to enjoy getting these updates, so I continue to give them. If you're getting sick of these, I'd be curious to hear from you um, just to get some feedback. You know, is talking about the pinch just getting to the point where you don't want to hear it anymore, or are you actually interested in this? And you can always send me emails, really any comments, questions, concerns you have about the podcast, you can always send them to me at info at selling your screenplay.com. So I have a finished version of the film which I sent out to my Kickstarter backers. I, I mean, I originally, when I did the Kickstarter, I had set it up and said that I would be done the film at the end of that year, which was 2016. So I'm way behind schedule. So I appreciate the patience and the support from all those Kickstarter backers. I literally, I never got a single complaint from any of the Kickstarter backers, even though I know I was definitely behind schedule in what I had originally predicted when I'd be able to deliver the film. So I sent the, um, as I said, I sent a link to all the Kickstarter backers with a um, link so that they could view the film. If you 
you are a Kickstarter backer and you didn't get this email, just email me. Um, it's easy for me to just send you the link um, personally. I don't have to go through the Kickstarter system, so I can definitely do that. In terms of buying the film or seeing the film, we're going to have to wait um, on that. If you're not a Kickstarter backer, I've just got to wait on that. I've got to let distribution kind of settle a little bit and figure out what is going to happen there. And that sort of segues into the next portion of this, you know, what I'm doing in terms of marketing and distribution. As mentioned previously on the podcast, I entered about 30 film festivals. So far, I've been rejected by two and accepted to none. So obviously, I'm hoping that gets a little bit more positive. I've got a couple of offers from distributors. I've been talking about these on the podcast over the last couple of months. So I've got to figure out which direction to go with those, if any, as I haven't ruled out self-distribution or maybe some sort of hybrid model where I do some self-distribution in some areas of the world and then a distributor does his distribution in other areas that I'm not able to do self-distribution. So all of this is sort of in flux and um, all of this needs to be determined. I've got half a mind to simply sit and wait and see what happens over the course of the next couple of months with film festivals. I mean, obviously getting, I mean, I've only heard from two, I entered about 30, so, you know, it still remains to be seen, but if I can get some traction, um, uh, in the film festival circuit, you know, you start, if you can get a little bit of traction, you go to the film festivals, maybe you meet some other film festival directors, they invite you to other film festivals. These things can snowball if you get a good run in the festivals, whether that's likely to happen, I don't know. I haven't really been down this road with a film like this before, so I'm not honestly sure how that's all going to turn out. You know, most likely I'm going to get into at least one or two of the 30 festivals, maybe hopefully three, that would be 10%. I'd say that's actually probably a pretty good number. So if I can get into even three of these 30 festivals, I'll probably be doing pretty good. And is that going to be enough to get this ball rolling? Yeah, doubt it. Um, but I will know in a couple of months, um, you know, I'll have a bunch more of the rejections um, or acceptances, hopefully acceptances from film festivals. And I'll start to get a feel for if that's going to go anywhere or not. If it's not going to go anywhere, then I'll probably just make a clean decision at that point to, um, to either go with one of these distributors or not. Um, you know, the, the problem is this film, you know, it's super low budget. It doesn't have any name cast. So when I'm talking to distributors, there's not a lot they can do with the film. I mean, they can take it and sort of put it through their channels. Um, but without these other elements, it's difficult for them to really do much with the film. Now, if I can get some, some recognition, from film festivals, all of a sudden that becomes just a little bit of a marketing hook that we can use. And, and you know, again, I haven't even submitted this film to Sundance or South by Southwest. None of the big festivals I don't think would, would accept a film like this. Um, and so I haven't even submitted to those. So I'm not going to get in. I'm not submitting to the big festivals. So I'm not going to get into the big festivals. So, um, and there is something from distributors. When you talk to distributors, a lot of times, ah, don't worry about the small festivals, but I'm hoping that some of these smaller festivals that I've entered, I'm hoping that I can get, as I said, a little bit of traction, maybe some awards. I can start to use that in my marketing to distributors. I can go back to some of these distributors and say, Hey, we get, we won some awards. You know, what's, what's your, um, what's your final offer? So I'm kind of hoping to see how that plays out. But even if none of the festival stuff pans out. Um, again, I still have self-distribution and I still do have some offers from these distributors. I don't think these offers are going to go anywhere in the next couple of months, honestly. Um, so I think I'm just going to sit on them and kind of see what happens. As I said, play my hand at the festival. So I'm already entered in the, into them. And over the course of the next two months, I will know I'll be starting to get a lot more of these um, acceptances or rejections. So I'll kind of have a, have a feel um, probably in about a month or two on how the festival run is going to go for me. But again, in either case, whether, whether I get a good festival run or don't, um, it still is probably not a bad idea. Just hedge my bet a little bit, wait and see how things shake out and then, um, make a real final decision probably in a month or two or maybe even three as far as what actually will be the who will actually be the distributor of the pinch so i just want to mention again i've mentioned this on the podcast before if you're interested in learning more about the pinch i did a um, webinar a couple of months ago where I went through the entire process of, of writing, directing, and producing a micro-budget feature film. I go into great detail on exactly how I wrote, directed, and produced this film. Specifically, I talk about how to write a micro-budget screenplay, how to, raise mon how to raise money to shoot a micro-budget screenplay, which includes a lot of information about how I successfully ran a Kickstarter campaign. And then I also dig into pre-production, production, and of course, post-production. The webinar is over three hours long, so there's a lot of information in it. I worked hard putting this webinar together so I am charging a small fee to view it. 
But if you're looking to write, direct, and or produce a micro-budget film, I think this could really help you a lot. There are tons, there are a ton of directors and producers out there looking for the next great micro-budget script. So even if you don't want to be a director and producer of a micro-budget film, just being a writer of micro-budget scripts, I think you'll get a lot of value out of this webinar as well, as it will really help you understand just sort of some of the practical realities of production. I think writing low-budget scripts um, that can be shot on a micro-budget level is a great way to meet up-and-coming directors and producers and get some produced writing credits. You can find these people, whether it be short films or even feature films, you can find them um, through places like mandy.com or craigslist.com certainly paid services like sys select which i'm going to talk about more um later today later in the podcast um all of these these places you know there's a lot of producers looking for low budget films stuff they can do fairly cheaply and again it's just a great way to get sort of on the board network with people see your stuff actually getting produced i'm just a big proponent of this again even if you don't want to go out and make your own film i think this webinar could potentially help you I will link to it in the show notes. You can go to the webinar if you go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash the pinch and the pinch is all over case case and all one word. It's literally sellingyourscreenplay.com slash the pinch. You can find information all about the webinar. I've also got a big announcement about sellingyourscreenplay.com and what I've been working on over this last six months or nine months. I'm rolling out a brand new platform for screenwriters to connect with producers. So stick around after the interview. I'm going to talk more about that. Anyway, that's what I'm working on. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing career screenwriting career strategist Carol Krishner. Here is the interview. Welcome, Carol, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. So to start out, maybe you can give us a little bit of um, uh, um, explanation about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Sure, sure. So um, I'm actually from Los Angeles, one of the few. Mm -hmm. And I started as a stand-up comic and then realized that since I wasn't Whoopi Goldberg or somebody fabulous, uh, I was just pretty good that um, I needed to go to the other side of the desk and I became a development executive. And I started with a small production company and then I was at CBS and comedy development. And then I went over to Steven Spielberg's first Amblin television department and started that. Um, I then became a consultant because I had a young daughter and all I was doing was traveling. Um, so we changed our lifestyle. I became a consultant and as a consultant, I created the CBS Diversity Writers Mentoring Program. And because of that, I was asked to help Jeff Melvoin develop the curriculum for the WGA Showrunner Training Program. And because of that, I was asked to help Humanitas New Voices uh, run that program. Um, I wrote a book called Hollywood Game Plan, How to Land a Job in Film, TV, or Digital Entertainment. I speak around the world. In fact, I'm going to India in two weeks to talk to them about the U.S. showrunner training model. Oh, nice. And I'm a career coach. Okay, perfect. Um, what, what is it about the entertainment business? And it sounds like stand-up comedy was sort of your first foray into it. What is it um, that attracted you to the entertainment business, do you think? Well, it's interesting because I remember thinking when I was in college, I don't care if I work from 8 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. I just don't want to have a nine to five job. I have to be more creative. And I used to love to tell stories and that sort of and make people laugh. That was just who I was. I, uh, I have this saying that the world's divided between those people who, if you say, get up on that stage and make people laugh, those people that will say, just kill me now. I, there's no way I do that. And those people that would step on your face to get up to the stage. And I was one of the second huh. type of people. Um, so just that I didn't want to work in an insurance company. I, I had to do something creative. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So let's talk about the WGA Showrunner Training Program. Maybe you can just kind of tell us what that's all about and who that program is for. Sure. It's a wonderful program. We're going into year 13. And just one second, 65 new series were created by alumni. Um, it's a very prestigious program. It's very competitive to get into. Let me tell you first who it's for. It's for senior level writers, people at the co-executive and executive producer on a show, or 
people that have a pilot script in active development or a pilot in active development at a studio or network. This year it was amazing. We have two people because we I just yesterday called everybody to let them know they got in or they didn't get in and the didn't get in or those hard phone calls mm -hmm. and the got in or the great phone calls. Um, two people have series on the air. Uh, we have people who have produced pilots that are waiting to hear whether or not their pilots are going to get picked up. We have people that are writing six. Amazon now wants you to, uh, no, TNT now wants you to write no, AMC wants you to write six scripts. They don't order pilots anymore. They do six scripts. And then if they like the scripts and the pilot script, then they order it to series. So we have people in that situation right now too. Mm -hmm. Is it oh, okay? Go is, ahead. Is it all WGA members? So that's since it sounds like you have to have some experience before you would get into it, you would by default, it sounds like be a WGA member or can anybody apply if they fit these other criteria? Oh, you have to be a WGA member. And, and the thing is, if you fit that criteria, you are a WGA member. It, it, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And so here's the program. It's six Saturday. And, and also this year we had 145 applicants for 25 slots. So it is intense. Yeah. Um, so it's six Saturdays starting in January and the they're they're organized around a theme each week so the first theme is going from writer to manager the second week is managing writers and the writers room the third week is managing production the fourth week is managing actors and executives the fifth week is managing post-production and the sixth week is managing your career and we have alumni who've just run their first shows, talk about what they did right, what they would do different, and very experienced showrunners talking about how they kept their shows on the air. Okay, perfect. And so let's, uh, maybe we can do an overview for the CBS Diversity Writers Program as well, just quickly, what that, what's that all about and, and who is that program for? Sure, um, the program is for people with diverse backgrounds and voices. Um, and, here's how it works um and and we had 1200 applicants for eight slots mm. it was talk about intense yeah. um so you don't have to be in the wga in fact we don't want you can't be in the wga and be in the program in order to apply you need a an original pilot and a spec of a current show and just as it's sort of an inside tip the spec and the pilot should be in the same genre. So you don't want to write a horror original and a comedy spec. Mm -hmm. If you're somebody who loves serialized drama, then you should do a serialized drama pilot and a serialized drama spec. Um, if you get into the, and then um, we choose 20 people to have interviews and you want to learn how to nail those interviews, which is what I work with clients on a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are accepted into the program, then you spend the first three months writing a new piece of material with an executive mentor, a studio or network current or development executive. Mm -hmm. Then I get them starting in January and we have 16 weeks of workshops. Most of the people who are speaking at the workshops are showrunners and we do uh, uh, mock showrunner meetings so that people can learn and they get feedback from the showrunner. You did this great. You need to work on that. We also so that by the time they go out and have actual showrunner meetings, they know how to do it. Um, I focus with people a lot on how you sell yourself, how you promote yourself, not promote yourself in a sleazy way, but how you talk about yourself in a way that gets people excited, knowing your personal A story mm -hmm. and your personal log line. Um, and uh, we also have agents and managers come and many people get signed who are in the program. And we have executives come and uh, they get to spend some time in a writing room. It's a fantastic program, and I really encourage your um, listeners, your audience, uh, to your watchers, <laughs> to apply to the program. And the uh, the dates to apply are March first through May first.
Okay, perfect. And I just wrote that down. I will get the actual link and I'll put that in the show notes so people can actually click over to it. Um, perfect. And they, they listen to that. So I think this is a good segue. Let's talk about just breaking into television. Um, some of the other people that I've had on the podcast that have broken in, a lot of them have used, um, and I'm not sure about this specific program, but there's other similar programs out there for new writers coming up. Yes. And that seems to be for television writing, sort of the tried and true. I mean, you can go work in a writer's room as sort of the writer's assistant or something and that's one path and then this seems to be another good path um, and maybe you can kind of elaborate on that and even correct me if I'm wrong but what is sort of the common ways that people break into television if you're you know fresh out of college or someone who's written a couple of specs and wants to break in what would you recommend that they do well um, absolutely apply to the fellowship programs um, apply to prestigious writing contests and in a little bit I'll t I'll list some of those um get a job as a writer's PA you know you said you know people can get a job as a writer's assistant the writer's assistant is a very difficult job yeah, to get yeah, yeah, no doubt, yeah I don't to, want to over overstate that yeah yeah you have to move up and so here's the hierarchy on a television series so the the entry level is the writer's PA and then if you're a good writer's PA, then you move up to being the assistant to a showrunner or an executive on the show. And if you do that well, then you have a shot at being the writer's assistant. And if you're a writer's assistant, it's very possible if you're doing a great job and they have enough episodes that you'll write a freelance script and get into the guild as an assist associate member. Then if you're great at that and you, and you have writing samples that the staff can read, and more importantly, that the showrunner can read, you could get staffed on the show the next season mm -hmm. as a staff writer. Okay. Um, of course, if your aunt is the president of the network, that's a way to get in. Mm -hmm. And if you know a showrunner, uh, you have a shot at getting that PA gig or the assistant to an executive or showrun. Mm -hmm. Would you say these um, fellowships are are they typically they get the writers to be like the the writers PA or even the assistant writer, or do you see people from these fellowship programs actually getting staffed as staff writers? Um, staffed at a staff writer level. Okay, okay, that's really the point of the program is to get. And the real point of the program, as I say about CBS and all the networks and all the studio programs are, we're not looking to get somebody just a job as a staff writer. We are grooming people to be showrunners. Um, and each of the, the fellowships um, provide uh, the production that's hiring the writer with money for that writer for the beginning 20 weeks or something like that, depending. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> how, excuse me. How viable in this day and age is, you know, doing something like a YouTube, creating a YouTube channel and creating videos there. And do you ever see writers segue from something like that? I mean, there's sort of these stories. I mean, there's sort of the, the easy stories you can choose, you can pick to, but is that like a viable path that is consistently churning up, turning up new writers and getting people staffed on writing shows, just doing something on your own? Absolutely. Okay. I'm going to launch into 10 ways to get an agent okay. because this is, um, and if you get representation, then it's much easier to get um, that, to get in for a showrunner interview to get those gigs. Um, so I have my list Perfect. and it'll cover some of the things that you said. You're, those are smart questions. So people always say, how do I get an agent, right? Mm -hmm. You're, uh, your constituent always asks that question, right? Very, Everybody wants very, to. Yeah, yeah, very common question. Um, and when I ask agents that, they say this very frustrating thing. They say, don't worry about finding us. If you're ready, we'll find you, um, which is true. So here's 10 ways to get an agent or a manager. And the first is to win a highly regarded contest or festival award. And it only counts if you come in the winner or first place. Um, if you're a quarter finalist, nobody's going to find you. And nobody except your mother cares about that. Mm -hmm. You have to be the winner or come in first, you know, second. Um, here's some television uh, um, contests I encourage people to apply for. There's the Tracking Bee 
dot com launch pad mm -hmm. and a guy named Mickey Fisher put one of his uh, pilot scripts there. He'd been a playwright in New York, a young assistant at WME, saw it, loved it, brought it to her boss. They brought it to Steven Spielberg's company. He loved it. Um, they brought it to the networks and there was a bidding war. Um, and just as an aside, everybody in Hollywood loves everything until they don't return your calls anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so, And that show got picked up uh, with a straight to series order and it was extant on CBS. So that was Tracking B. The other is obviously the Austin TV pilot contest. The Page Awards have a pilot contest Final Draft Big Break is very good. Uh, the Sundance TV Lab. Um, those are some. Don't spend your time, as I like to say, on Schmageggy television writing contests because nobody, none of the people that are going to help you are looking at those contests, just the top four or five. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's one way. Two is, as you just said, be selected to be in one of the fellowships like CBS, like NBC, like ABC, like Warner's, like Fox. Um, and HBO has one. Uh, three is to get an overwhelmingly enthusiastic response to a one woman show or your stand up or your improv. Um, four is getting half a million hits on your YouTube uh, video or web, web series, which is a question you just asked. And yes, uh, you can get um, an agent or manager will pay attention to that. Hold on one second. Let me turn this off. Um, because there's these 22 year old people at the agencies, these really young people, and they're spending all day online looking for this. Um, they're also going to stand-up clubs to find stand-ups. Uh, five is get referred by a friend of the manager or the agent, um, an acquaintance. Uh, the sixth is getting referred by a current client. Um, and the way that works is that when – so when – agent or manager has a stack of scripts this high. Can you see that? This high. Yep, yep. So um, the ones that come to the very top are the ones that have been referred by their clients because they want to keep their clients happy. And then next down is people from uh, friends and acquaintances. And then further down are things that just have come to them through cold queries or uh, through people that aren't close acquaintances. Um, and then seven is being referred by an industry professional. There's some, you know, screenwriting teachers who have connections in the entertainment industry. Eight, and I used to think this didn't work, but I have a client that this worked for, which is send a cold query letter. Um, she sent out 90 emails. <laughs> 11 uh, managers responded to her and asked for the script. Hmm. And of those 11, three of them read the script, liked it, met with her, and all three of them wanted to represent her. So it is possible. Um, nine is get a job working in the industry. Um, if you get a job in the industry, you will know connections to people who know agents and managers. And 10, is already be making money as a writer because the agents love to poach other right other companies uh, clients. However, for managers, they a new manager. If you already have a manager, let's say you don't like, you don't want to work with, a new manager won't meet with you until you sever ties with your old manager. Okay. Good to know. Um, that's all great advice. Um, I wonder if we can talk a little bit about what something you mentioned about these showrunner interviews. Like once you get those things, maybe there's some tips for people um, that have actually made it to that point where they're actually going in on these interviews. Sounds like you do a lot with that. Um, so maybe we have a couple tips there. Sure, absolutely. So the first thing is to read the pilot script that you're going in to meet on. And if you can watch the pilot, if, if this is for a new show, mm -hmm. read the script a couple of different times, watch the pilot, have very smart things to say about it. Um, 
what you also need to do, and I'll come back to that in a minute, you need to totally uh, research the showrunner that you're meeting with so you know who they are, what they have done, so you can comment on that and sort of the small talk part of it. Um, you should have the stories from your personal life, which I call your personal nuggets, which I work very hard with my clients on. So when they have those meetings, they're, you know, they crush it. So what you want is to sort of dig through your life and find stories that are relevant to the show that you're meeting with the showrunner on. So if it's about a sorority, you can say, you know what, I was in a sorority, my mom was in a sorority, and tell a interesting story that happened um, in your sorority. What showrunners are looking for are show our story machines. They need to know that you can generate a lot of ideas. Let's go back to being able to say something smart about the script uh, or the pilot. Don't, I mean, you could say you loved it, always say you loved it, but then talk specifically about why you loved it. And, and don't make it so general that it doesn't make any sense. And what you can also say is, you know, I love, the uh, father in this. And, you know, I would have loved to see, I would love to see more of the wife. And they may ask you for ideas and you don't want to come in with pitches, but you want to come on in with general ideas like, you know, I think it would be really interesting. And I would love to write the sister's uh, arc. And, you know, as I was reading, I thought, you know, maybe somewhere down the line, she joins a motorcycle gang. Um, that's about the, the extent to the amount of, you know, pitching that you should do. And why, um, not, why um, not come in? I mean, depending on what type of a show it is, if it's a very episodic show, why not come in with some actual ideas for, for future episodes? Uh, I would only come in with a couple and I would just have the log on. Uh, they're not supposed to ask you to pitch ideas. That's I against see. the guild rules. I see. I see. Um, but if, if you say, you know, this detective who has a limp, um, I just thought that it would be so fun to see him have to go to a, an arcade, you know, something like that, but no more than that. I see. And, you know, come 10 minutes early, they'll give you a bottle of water, take the water because everybody's throat gets dry when they get nervous and it gives you something to do with your hands. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about these personal nuggets that you just mentioned. I wonder if you can give kind of an example of what that actually is. Sure, sure. So here's some actual examples from mentees um, and clients. Uh, the first one is, um, I got kicked out of the Girl Scouts for telling a dirty joke when I was 10 years old. That's mine. Okay. Um, there was the story of a mentee of mine who went to Russia on sort of a, a student abroad program and he was coming out of a nightclub and these Russian officials interrogated him because they thought that he was a spy. Um, there is the story, and this is, all of these are true stories. Mm -hmm. There's the story of a mentee who came out to his Mormon family as a gay man on the CBS show Survivor. Um, he wasn't prepared to tell, but it came out on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is my grandfather won my grandmother in a card game. Um, th those are the kinds of things, you know, when I was 12, I, uh, let's see, what's some of them? Um, so, but the, well, the idea is you're just trying to be relatable and that kind of stuff. I mean, using your Girl Scout examples, getting kicked out of the Girl Scouts, is that do you try and have a number of these stories so that you can, like if this particular project is about the Girl Scouts, then you go in there and you tell your story about the Girl Scouts, it really makes you the perfect writer because you have experience with this. Or are, right. they more general, are they more general stories that you're just telling to make yourself more relatable and funny perhaps? Right. You should have like 10 to 15 or 20 different nuggets that you have on your computer in a file so that when you're going on a meeting, you can go through and say, well, this is relevant. Mm. That's relevant. You know, I lived in foster care for eight years. That's relevant. Um, and then have a story about being in foster care. Uh, 
you use your nuggets in meetings, let's say general meetings with executives, just to show that you're interesting, that you have a colorful background, that you know how to tell stories, because writers are supposed to be storytellers. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to tell a story about yourself that shows how interesting you are mm -hmm. and you know, how successful you are. Yeah. So um, going back to just what you had mentioned about the CBS um, diversity program, you had mentioned that you need a original spec and a spec based on a current show. Um, is yes. that typical? What are you recommending now to writers? Like as they move along in their careers, um, is that very typical? You want to have one of each that you can show, you can write original characters, you can also write existing characters? Um, for the fellowships, for my fellowship, that's what you need, an original and a spec. Mm -hmm. For other fellowships, they just ask for a spec first, but if you make it to the next round, then they're going to ask for a pilot. And in terms of what a writer breaking in needs, they need two original pilots in their portfolio that are what I call blazing hot. Not just good, but blazing hot. And you should have a spec because some showrunners are only interested in reading specs. They don't really care about your original voice. Uh, they're glad you have one. But what they want to know is that you can write in somebody else's voice because that's what you do if you're on a show. With You write in the voice and you support the showrunner. Yeah, yeah. What are some of the big mistakes that you see um, people making as they're trying to break in? Let me think about that. Um, being too pushy, meeting somebody and saying, read my script. Um, that's always a turnoff. Uh, wait until you have a relationship with somebody before you say, um, will you read my script? And it, when you do say read my script, you might say, when you have time, I know how busy you are. Because everybody in Hollywood is busy. If you um, had the time to read my script and give me notes, I'd be so grateful. It takes, if it's an hour pilot, it takes an hour to go through, read it and make mm -hmm. notes. You're asking somebody for a lot. Don't ask strangers. Um, another thing is sending out material before it's ready, before it's perfect. A lot of people think, you know what? I, I can do another draft. I just really want to get this out. Don't do that. Make sure that it's ready. The other is not connecting with enough people, you know, staying in your house and not not going out, not meeting new people, because that's a really important part of it. Um, what sort don't of, be a dick. What sort of events would you recommend to writers that are looking to break in? Like what sort of networking events um, would be sure. helpful? Sure. So the Writers Guild uh, Foundation has panels and events that you don't have to be in the guild in order to attend. I always recommend that. Um, if you're a woman, there's something called Chicks with Scripts, and they do uh, networking events. The Television Blacklist has a, um, they have a cocktail party, you know, networking get together. Jen Grisanti, who's fantastic, does a once a month Friday night drinks, and I think there's like 80 people there, a lot of people to meet. You want to get on her mailing list so you can find out when it is. Um, that's just some of the things I'd recommend. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in, as I was researching this, um, just preparing for this, this interview, um, there was a lot of, um, stuff where you're talking about the unwritten rules and know the unwritten rules. And I wonder if you can just talk about that a little bit and maybe even give us one or two of these unwritten rules that, um, that are out there that people need to know before, before trying to become a TV writer. Sure. Well, I sort of mentioned, uh, a couple of them when I said what not to do, mm -hmm. um, Here's the thing, people, there, there's two parts of this. One is people want to find new voices. They really are interested in that because if they find somebody who's great, it makes them look good. The other side of that is people are really busy and they don't have the time to read a script from somebody they don't know. And there's something that we, had at the network called the life is too short list and this goes back to don't be a dick if you are annoying if you are if you don't take notes well then unless you're brilliant people are not going to want to work with you again mm -hmm. um you need to be really nice to assistants because the truth is the assistant 
will talk to his or her boss and the assistant is the gatekeeper. So if you are great to the assistant, when he or she talks to their boss, they're gonna say, God, um, Ashley was such a pleasure. And that will make the boss already feel positively inclined mm-hmm. towards you. Okay. And so this next question is going to be a three, maybe four part, um, four part question, <laughs> but I'd just be curious to get your take on it. So you mentioned just a moment ago is don't send your material out before it's ready. And this is, you know, it's a very, it's easier said than done. Cause even if you're willing to do the work and constantly rewrite, it's not always clear. And I'd be curious to get your take. I mean, um, you worked, um, at Steven Spielberg's, um, television company and are there some, some projects that came in that you thought were not ready? And then they took them elsewhere and they were big hits. And then the flip side of that question is, um, were there some projects that came in that you thought were just absolutely outstanding, um, but for whatever reason, they didn't get any traction. And I asked this question. I find this fascinating. I saw an interview with Quentin Tarantino and Robert, Robert Rodriguez was interviewing Quentin Tarantino and they were talking about, this was like maybe five years ago, and they were talking about Pulp Fiction and they had done a screening for the executives, but not released the film yet. And even Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez at that time in 1993 or whenever it was, they were not sure, the executives were not sure if this movie was gonna work and they themselves were not even that confident that it was gonna work. So it's not always that clear whether something is working or something is as developed as possible. Um, so I guess that's the first part of the question is, um, how do you know when material is ready? And then, you know, just as sort of anecdotally, um, you know, are there some of those projects that you thought weren't ready, but then they ended up, you know, working in some other format or, and then were there some other projects you thought were ready, but didn't work? Um, so I have to go back to the first one. Um, the first one was projects Ask me the first question. Okay, the first question is, when you were working, just, when you were working in television, seeing a lot of pitches, were yeah. there some projects that came in that you just uh, thought were not ready, but they ended up going elsewhere and being successful, you know, with another channel or another network? Right. Um, it, it's not so much about not being ready. There's two parts to that. Not being ready is a script that's not good enough. That's what I mean by not ready. Mm-hmm. What you're talking about is taste. Um, NBC passed on the Bill Cosby show. And even though we know everything that's going on with Bill Cosby at the time, that was a fantastic show. Mm -hmm. Let's see. um, I think eight different networks passed on Breaking Bad. In fact, one executive said, that's the worst idea for television series I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. Um, He later went and apologized to Vince Gilligan. Um, Off the top of my head, I cannot think of something that I read that I thought this is great that we let pass through our fingers and it went someplace else, except that happens all the time. Like I just said Mm -hmm. about, you know, Vince's show and other people's show where they, the executives kick themselves in the butt because they didn't have the courage to do it or they just didn't get it. Um, so again, we're talking about two different things. But don't you, in think, order... don't you think there is a sort of a blurred line where at some point it becomes more about taste than, oh, this script is not good enough. I mean, you know, like there's just, there's some point where you get to the point where it's some one person says this script is not good, whereas another person says this script is great. And so at some point, those lines of taste versus just not being ready are, blur- are a little bit blurry. Um, actually, I don't agree with you. I, I, sorry. Um, it's once your script is blazing hot, then it's ready. Whether people buy it or not is a different question. It's a taste question. But if you're sending in a script where there's typos, where the characters are not well developed, where it's a first or second draft, then that gets dismissed immediately as being amateurish. Mm -hmm. But there's many scripts that are beautifully done, that are wonderful, that get passed on. There's scripts that are in drawers and have been in drawers for years because the timing wasn't right. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, it does. It definitely does. Um, and so what, what would you recommend to a writer? For, like, how can they tell that their material is ready? And maybe it just goes back to a lot of what you've been saying, like enter contests and start, you know, getting those quarterfinals or semifinal placements and contests are sort of an objective measure. Um, but maybe there's just like, how do you know when your material is ready? Um, you show it to people 
and you show it to people that are discerning. And if you know anybody in the entertainment industry, assistants um, or PAs, Mm -hmm. show it to them. And if you're getting people saying, I don't get this, or that character sort of bored me, then it's not ready. If, If you're getting really good feedback, um, then it means that it's ready. Um, and, but, but I'm not talking about really good feedback from your mom <laughs> or depending on your relationship with your mom, you might not get good feedback no matter what. Um, you need to show it to a number of people before you send it out. It's interesting because my daughter, who's um, a comedy writer, her boyfriend just finished a pilot script and one, and there's a writer on a television series who said he would read it. And her boyfriend was gonna send it without anybody giving notes on it before it got sent to the writer. You have one shot. Um, entry into contest is a good idea, but but the, you don't know who's reading it. If you, you know, pay money to get feedback, get lots of feedback and only take in the notes that resonate for you. Because sometimes it's college students that are reading your script. Sometimes it's actors that are reading your script. You just don't know. Mm -hmm. They're not generally network executives. That's almost never. So get a couple of them and see if you're getting similar notes. Okay. And I just want to push back and I am not, I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate. I'm not completely sure. disagreeing with you. I just want to push back a little bit again, going back to what I was saying earlier. And I'll give you a specific example. I had a film noir script, which I had submitted around and you know, some people liked it, some people didn't. And I'll give you an example. Yep. I had, I did a cold submission um, to a production company that was run by Arthur Hiller. He's done some iconic movies like Silver Street. Oh, yeah. And he literally called me on the phone and um, said, I love the script. I'm going to take it to my contacts. I thought fantastic. Um, so so, I mean, he's someone that's had success in the industry. So I have to assume like trust that he is, you know, at least has some credibility. I took it to another producer who I will not name because um, I don't want to embarrass him or, or anything else, but he literally thought the thing was garbage and it was the worst meeting. And this was, you know, a while later, but I had sent it to him and he was excited just to, to like on the premise or something. He set up a meeting and I showed up for the meeting on Monday. He's like, man, I'm sorry. I should have canceled this. This script is just literally terrible. And so it was literally the same script. And so I, like as from the writer standpoint, it just, it gets difficult to dis- determine whether that is that script ready or, Arthur Hiller really liked it. And this other producer has produced movies that you have heard of. I mean, he's an experienced, successful producer. So right. I, mean, I trust both. I mean, both are, are, is either one of them right? Is either one of them wrong? It's hard to say. Um, first of all, congratulations on having Arthur Hiller be excited about your material. Mazel tov. Um, If there's somebody in the business who's respected, who said, I love this, then you're in great shape. The fact that this other producer who sounds like an awful person to say that to you. I, frankly, I respected his his directness. Like there was no point in wasting in sitting in a meeting yeah. where he knew his. So I, I was not it, it wasn't. I mean, he was just kind of being honest. He was giving me his honest right. opinion of my script. You know, and- you're right. You're right. A quick no is often as kind as a yes. Uh, never quite as exciting, but as kind. Mm-hmm. Just because so. So in terms of is it ready, if you're getting great responses from most of the people and you get an Arthur Hiller or another producer that says, I'm very excited about this, then it's ready. But you can't determine everybody's taste. You don't have control over that. So you're going to get the exact experience that you had, which is Arthur Hiller says, I love this. I'm taking it to my contacts. And producer X says, I I didn't respond to this at all. This is garbage. I don't want, I mean, I don't think any producer should ever say this is garbage, but you know, I, this wasn't for me. That's the correct response for any producer or executive. You know what? This is not for me. Um, You very few times will you send something out that everybody loves. That's, like a dream that doesn't mm-hmm. happen all that often. It does happen sometimes, but not that often. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So let's let's talk about um, your Hollywood boot camp. Maybe you can kind of tell us about that. Um, what's that all about, and um, how can people learn more about it? Sure. So I had to learn the hard way on how you break into this business. I made a lot of mistakes, and I. I vowed to myself that when I made it, 
I was going to help other people learn how to do it, how not to make the mistakes I made. So I wrote the book, Hollywood Boot Camp, How to Land a... No, Hollywood Game Plan, How to Land a Job in Film, TV, or Digital Entertainment. And then a couple of years later, I realized there were a lot of things that could be added to that. And I produced the Hollywood Boot Camp, Carol Kirshner's Hollywood Boot Camp, mm -hmm. How to Get Your First or Next Job in Hollywood. And it's uh, 20 videos. I mean, they're about 10 minutes long. You can watch them all at the same time. You can watch one. You can do whatever you want. You can listen to them. Um, and it goes into detail about what you need to do to break in. And it talks about everything from how you have that first meeting to how you get that meeting to how you should dress for that meeting. It's, it covers everything, how you follow up effectively without being annoying. Mm -hmm. um, and to find out more about it, uh, go to ckbootcamp.com. Perfect. ckbootcamp.com. Perfect. And I'll get that in the show notes as well. Um, do you recommend people read the book before they do the boot camp? No, I think the boot camp can come first. I really do. Okay. Um, and if you don't want to do the boot camp, the boot camp's more personal. It's more stories. It's more in depth. But if if that's not what you want, you can certainly read the book. There's some of the same stuff in it. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the boot camp has more. Um, and uh, we've gotten really great response from it. People say, "I wish I had found this," you know a year ago, two years ago when I was, I wouldn't have made these mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then it sounds like the third arm of your business is your personal consulting. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about, about that. Sure. Um, well, the first thing is I, I don't take everybody. You heard all the things I do. So I have mm -hmm. really limited time. Sure. Um, I take people who only who I feel I can help and what we work on is sort of what I consider the four pillars of being a successful writer. Um, as I studied writers over the years who were successful, these are the things they had in common. And one was blazing hot material, which we talked about. Um, then the other was having a really smart self marketing strategy. So they know how to talk about themselves. They know which of those stories are the right stories to tell. Um, I have, I teach people something called their personal log line and their personal A story. And then we work on those personal nuggets. The third is having a comprehensive community of contacts and relationships. That's really important. So I work with my clients on that. And then the fourth thing is these successful writers were industry savvy. They knew who the players were in the business. They knew where the best place to take their material was. And I work with that on my client, with my clients. Okay. So that's what I do in coaching. I really, I tell people the honest truth, but I'm nice about it. Mm -hmm. And we set up uh, milestones and I support them as they achieve those. Okay, perfect, perfect. And um, is there a specific website that people can learn more about that? Yeah, thanks for asking that. It's carolkirshner.com, okay. which is C-A-R-O-L-E. Well, you'll have it on there, right? Yeah, so, yep, exactly. I'll, I'll, put, I'll make sure I put that in the show notes yeah, as well. Yeah, so, so. carolkirshner.com is my website. Okay. You can see everything about what I do, including my coaching uh, services. Okay, perfect. And um, I, I'm just starting to ask this question really for my own personal needs. Um, me and my wife are always watching stuff at night and we're always looking for good shows to watch. What are some things that you've watched recently that you really like that's on Netflix or Hulu or any of the services? Right. Um, huh, I watch a lot of comedy. Okay. So I love The Good Place on NBC. It's not streaming, but I think it's charming and wonderful. I like Better Things on FX a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I watch Catastrophe on Netflix. Yep. Um, we watch something, this is a really old show, but it's so good, called Broad Church. It's a BBC show. Hmm. Um, it's, a, it's a mystery that's wonderful, really nuanced. Okay. Um, let me think what else I watch. Um, I watch a lot of documentaries. I just watched a Lady Gaga documentary that I thought was great. Um, what I like Big Little Lies, as did everybody else in the world. Yeah, I didn't want to like it because I didn't want to be one of those groupies, but I really liked it. Yeah, yeah it was good. I, I like um, the Santa Clarita Diet. That's going to come out again. 
Um, so those are the shows that I like. Perfect, perfect. And um, what's the best way for people to keep up? We've talked about your website, um, but maybe there's a Twitter handle, Facebook page, anything you're comfortable sharing. I will also get that in the show notes as well. Sure, thanks. Uh, Twitter is at Carol Kirsch. Um, Facebook is Carol Kirshner Entertainment Career Strategies. Okay, perfect. And I wish I knew my name on Instagram, but I think it's Carol Kirshner. <laughs> Yep. And I'll figure that out. And again, I'll put that in the show notes. Well, Carol, this has been great information. I get a ton of emails about TV writing, something that I don't know a ton about. So this was great to have you on. I know this is going to help a lot of people. Oh, thanks. It was a pleasure to do it. Thank you for having me. And I wish everybody good luck because here's the truth. If you have great material, it will be found. And today with 400 scripted shows on the air, they look for content everywhere. Mm-hmm. For sure, for sure. Thank you very much, Carol. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. I just want to mention a brand new service that I've rolled out over the last couple of weeks. I haven't talked about this on the podcast at all, so this is the first time, but it's really been my main focus now for many, many months, and it's been a big project. I've been trying to just get it launched, and finally, I was able to launch it a couple of weeks ago to SYS Select members. So here's what it's all about. I have built the SYS Select screenplay database. Screenwriters upload their scripts along with a logline synopsis and other pertinent information like budget and genre. And then producers search for and hopefully find screenplays that they want to produce. I'm adding features to this new service nearly every day. So ultimately it will be the main hub for all of the SYS Select services. If you're a member of SYS Select already, you should have already received your login information. If you haven't, please let me know. Just send me an email, info selling your screenplay.com and I will get you um, your login information because you are, if you're a member of SYS Select, you're already a part of this new service and should already know something about it because I've sent out several emails to SYS Select members. So again, if you don't know what I'm talking about and you're an SYS Select member, send me an email and I will give you all that information. I invited in a few dozen producers a couple of weeks ago. So there are already some producers in the system searching for screenplays. I'm going to keep the current price in place for the next month or so as I try and ramp up, ramp the services up. I probably will increase the price after that. So if you sign up now, you'll get grandfathered in on the current pricing. So when I do the price increase, the price increase won't affect you. I'm not going to increase the price for any current subscriptions. So now is a good time to join and save a little bit of money each month. And if you followed SYS Select and other services I offer through selling your screenplay, you'll know I never get about discounts. So this is really the closest thing to a discount that I'm going to offer. To learn more about this, go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. When you join SYS Select, you get access to this brand new screenplay database, along with all the other services that we're providing to SYS Select members, which include there's a newsletter, this monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively seeking writers and screenplays. Each SYS Select member can pitch one screenplay in this monthly newsletter. We also provide screenwriting leads. We have partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads sites out there, so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, we've been receiving seeing about five to 10 high quality paid leads per week. These are producers and production companies who are actively looking to buy material or who are looking to hire a screenwriter for a specific project. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. These leads run the gamut from production companies looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas or properties. Producers are looking for shorts, features, TV and web series pilots. It's a huge array of different types of projects that these producers are looking for. And these leads are, of course, exclusive to our partner and SYS Select members. Also, you get access to the SYS Select Forum, where we will help you with your log line and query letter and answer any screenwriting related questions that you might have. Also in the SYS Select Forum is all the recorded screenwriting classes that I've done over the years. So you'll have access to all of those as well. You can learn about the um, SYS Select screenwriting classes by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash online dash classes. I'll link to it in the show notes as that URL is not the easiest one to remember, but 
it's basically sellingyourscreenplay.com slash online dash classes. I think there's more than a dozen classes that um, I did and have put into the SYS Select forum. As I said, all of them are screenwriting related, pitching, writing a log line, you know, preparing to write your script, outlining your script, writing your script, writing the first 10 pages, the first act, the second act, all of those different components of a screenplay are broken down individual into individual classes that I go through and teach. And there's even some classes that are taught by other people as well. So again, it's a pretty big array of different screenwriting related subjects. Once again, if this all sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, please go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. So on the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing um, actress and producer Kelly Smith Westbrook. She recently did a film called People You May Know. It's a comedy drama about a young man who uses social media to raise his social status. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.